Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Thanks for being here. This is an exciting project today. We're forging an integral knife, which is which means that the blade, the bolster, and the tang is all forged from one piece of steel. So pretty cool. We're gonna get into it and uh, talk about how to do this and and all this kind of stuff. This is one of two versions of this video. The other one is longer, and I'm dealing specifically with the type of steel, which is 52100. In that video, the heat treat process, um, focusing specifically on working with that steel. So, uh, if you if you're into making knives yourself um, and are interested in working with 52100 steel at all, definitely check that one out. So, I'm using a 7 8 inch round stock for this project, and like I said, this is 52100 steel, which is uh, bearing steel, and it's probably even more commonly recognized in the ball bearing. Uh, um, state if you will in that form but it's the same stuff it's it's a great steel and uh, de will definitely make a good knife so forging the blade on an integral is really very similar to any other blade that you're going to forge the most the most difficult part of the uh, project really in my opinion is making that transition between the blade and the bolster and then also the transition between the bolster and the tang I will say that having some kind of tool that gives you equal opposing forces to sort of pinch or squeeze the metal between uh, definitely helps. And so if you don't have a press or a power hammer or something like that, um, well, specifically a press, uh, then some kind of like guillotine or some people say guillotine tool that goes on your anvil that will help with that is definitely a good idea. But here you can see I'm just forging the bevel down and, and widening out that um, that blade there. Uh, and so I'm making this a drop edge blade, obviously, and that provides a natural sort of guard to the blade. And I could have gotten more of a drop edge if I hadn't uh, narrowed down the steel um, right after I squished it flat, if that makes sense. I should have could have forged it all down to the bottom side of the knife blade. I chose to lengthen it out a little bit, narrow it out a little bit, and then forge that drop edge. But it's all, it all just depends on what style of knife you want to do and uh, what your desired result is. But there's definitely plenty of stock here to forge a blade, at least of this size. I wouldn't recommend trying to do an integral with anything smaller than 7 8 inch diameter. And that might seem big, but once you get it out of the forge and start hammering on it and it's easy to make that bolster area a little bit smaller it's not a very it's not very big around um, one inch and, and even an inch and an eighth or you know something um, especially for bigger knives definitely be preferable to, to do an integral with because you can always forge it down smaller if you need to so I got the blade forged out for the most part I'm going to go ahead and work on the tang now primarily so that I can get that established and then I'll be able to hold it with a different set of tongs and, and then refine the blade forging a little bit better a little bit better than it is now and uh, the, 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 the tang is essentially a square tapered bar with kind of rounded edges and there's plenty of material there to make that happen and, and of course you've got a shoulder there that the uh, the tang extends out from the bolster and you can make that you know shorter or longer the bolster shorter or longer depending on what you want to do but obviously there's sort of a range within there that you don't want it too big or too small if that makes sense so I'm just refining the bevel here on the blade and uh, 52100 forges easily um, you will notice though that once it drops below below optimal forging temperature it starts to stiffen up um, pretty quickly in a way that steels uh, like 1095, 1080 won't do. And the reason is because uh, uh, 52100 has about 1% carbon, which is, which is quite high for um, forging steels or, or high carbon steels that are not also high alloy. But it, then it has um, some, some low alloy, which is 1.5% uh, chromium. And so those things combined, it uh, you you don't want to forge it below about 1700 degrees. And if you do start, if you do keep hitting on it as it continues to cool, you really run the risk of damaging the steel. 
and you may not see that until maybe when you quench it and it cracks so just be aware of that but it really it really tells you when it starts you know when, when you're when you need to put it back in the forge so I'm nor I normalized it at 1625 degrees and this is a very important part of the process and then I did two thermo cycles at 1500 and then 1450 and here I'm quenching it um, it's important to hold the temperature on each of these processes for a uh, period of time and I did 15 minutes which I think is um, you could go even you know 20 or 25 without really hurting the steel but uh, it's important to do that so that the uh, components of the steel have the time to go into solution and go where they need to go the chromium content in there kind of slows things down a little bit so I quenched it and um, left it in the quench a little longer than I typically do just because of that mass of the bolster there didn't want it too much residual heat but I probably could have pulled out a little bit sooner, but here I'm trying to get the blade a little straighter, um, just right off of the bolster. It was kind of, there was a little bit of a kick to it. And one nice thing about 52100 steel is that there is a nice window uh, of time after the quench, assuming you're not quenching it all the way down to ambient temperature, uh, where you can work with that and straighten things out. And that's due to the chromium content that slows processes down in and affects things that way. So here I'm doing a dry ice quench and um, you'll want to go watch the other video too because I talk about this whole uh, issue in depth of the heat treating and why I'm doing this. But the reason for a dry ice quench is to um, convert retained austenite to martensite and retained austenite is uh, just a small percentage of the steel that didn't fully convert or didn't convert to martensite which is this type or the, the phase of steel that we want uh, to make a knife out of and then we temper it from there. So the dry ice is crushed or powdered dry ice in uh, mineral spirits which is makes a slurry and it gets it down to about negative 95 degrees and accomplishes that. Um, this really should not be necessary in uh, the 52100 steel if you're doing your heat treating properly um, but I go into that in depth in their video as well. So I've got it out of the temper, tempered it out at 375 degrees, which should give us a good edge retention, and it, and it did. Uh, it does give us good edge retention and uh, a good level of toughness for the type of knife that it is. So now it's time to rough grind the blade, and I haven't done any grinding on it so far. I've got it, had it forged down to an appropriate thickness uh, prior to heat my heat treating processes. Um, I'm using a ceramic belts from Empire Abrasives here and I really like them. They work very well for removing stock and I like to start out with a 40 grit and go up to 120 grit and then here I'm using a different finishing belt but um, if you go to Empire Abrasives uh, click the link in the description below that helps the channel out and also if you use Fire Creek as a uh, promotional code um, you get 10% off and you also help the channel and uh, if you're shopping around Black Friday um, check their website for a different code that will give you even more off but uh, click the link in the description below thanks for that helping the channel I appreciate that so uh, grinding in the shoulders on this bolster here and this is something that uh, can be a little finicky and I quite honestly I don't know the best way to do this um, I'm, I'm just getting it close right there and then I have to go into hand sanding the blade and finishing that so the probably one of the hardest parts of of uh, making an integral knife is the transition between the bolster and the um, the blade and so you want uh, a certain radius there it doesn't have to be a specific radius I'm just using uh, my small wheel on the grinder to sort of establish what size that radius is uh, but it can be smaller or larger depending on your preference and what you have I have seen guys use a jig on their grinder that has a, a radius and then a flat plate and it's all one piece of steel that the belt runs over and so you're literally able to put your blade onto that and grind all of everything at once as there's a there's a clean consistent transition that you're not trying to blend um, you know by hand so much so if I you know doing a bunch of integrals that'd be something good to invest in for sure so you, there you can see I tempered the tang out and um, that's for uh, strength and then also uh, peening the end of the tang eventually here 
I, I did get that up to a dull red heat, a low red heat, so we sphere, spheridizing that portion of it to make it nice and soft. And then of course, um, tempering out the bolster and into the, um, the blade just a bit, not the edge, but the blade, so there's a nice good strength there into that transition. But that'll also allow me to file the shoulders on that bolster, which isn't really possible with the blade uh, fully heat treated like that. So I'm using a piece of uh, yellow heartwood, which is pretty, it's, it's yellow, it's, it's, a cool, it's a cool wood to use. And trying something a little different here, I've got that tapered tang on there, and the, the plan is to obviously bed it with epoxy on the final handle installation. But I'm using two different uh, sizes of drill bits here to, uh, to make the hole for the, the tang. And I'm starting with uh, a 5 uh, drill bit here. And then I'll flip the block over and, and drill it out with, I believe it's about a half inch. No, yeah, about a half inch drill bit. Um, you'll see that in a second here. And what that's going to allow me to do is to uh, install the handle block onto the tang and already have, in effect, a very rough taper uh, to that block. So doing it this way, uh, there's not a whole lot of you know fitting to do other than right up against the bolster there. And again, I'm going to fill that all in with epoxy on the final installation so there's not going to be those voids that would otherwise be there. So it'll be a, a sturdy and good handle construction. So, so not, a, not, a, not a bad way to do it. Um, a lot easier than some other ways. So I'm just getting the... the uh, surface of that handle block that's going to match up to the uh, bolster there as close as possible and it's pretty close right there but uh, I'm going to put in a copper spacer and there's a couple reasons for that one it allows me to um, take up any tiny gaps there are between the wood and that uh, bolster that bolster is not filed completely flat and com you know completely square there's some very small irregularities to it uh, but the other thing that this does and probably more importantly instead of just trying to take a shortcut is that it allows a transition between that uh, forge finished bolster and the handle wood um, there's probably another way to do it I'm sure I don't know of a really good way to to get uh, that transition without really marring up or you know grinding off or sanding off that forge finish on the bolster so if you want to leave the forge finish on the bolster uh, in my opinion this isn't a bad way to do it because you do leave that copper washer or spacer just a little bit proud on the bolster side and sanded flush on the wood side and so yeah there is there is a you know edge or whatever that you can catch your fingernail on but that's by design so that you're not sanding or grinding all the way down on that forge finish on that bolster if that's what you're trying to preserve which in this case I am and so that's one way to do it so right here I um, I've got the uh, copper nice and soft as it can be as, as soft as possible you know heating up to a red heat and quenching and that's how you soften copper and now I can hammer this uh, handle wood down on there and really uh, deform that little piece of copper exactly to the shape of the bolster the back side of that bolster and the handle wood and get a really nice tight fit there and so that's just a little bit of hammering tap that down on there and now we're ready to work on the butt plate of this knife which is also going to be copper and so doing a little forging here using the uh, the uh, torch to uh, forge this out. I'm kind of forging it to sort of a domed shape, if you will, as you can probably see. And uh, we'll, leave, we'll leave that uh, nice hammer finish on there. And then I'm going to go ahead and soften this one as well to, so that it's uh, as soft as it can be. It comes pretty soft anyway, but this, this is the softest you can get it. So now I've got a 3 16th inch hole drilled in it and I'm going to literally just hammer that down onto the tang. And this is not going to have any holding power on its own. This is just an easy way or simple way to get a uh, 
pretty tight fitting hole on a tang that is not completely round. That tang is kind of an oval cross section, kind of irregular. And so rather than trying to, you know, you could go and grind that tang round, you know, and make it into, you know, three sixteenths or maybe an eighth of an inch round, whatever you're able to do. But that allowed me to just um, deform the, that copper butt plate to, to the shape of the tang and uh, save that step of shape of making the tang round all the way. Anyway, so tapping this down, getting that nice tight fit with all that epoxy in there and uh, making sure that everything fits tightly. <clears throat> so typically what I would do is I'd l allow the epoxy to set most of the way before peening down this tang. Um, I decided to go ahead and try to peen this tang down to where the whole handle assembly was tight before the uh, epoxy set <clears throat> so that I was um, certain that I had you know a mechanical good tight mechanical fit without the epoxy and then add the epoxy strength to that and you're, you're good to go. I was able to accomplish that uh, but I actually did reheat the end of that tang real briefly with the torch, um, not something I like to do. But 52100 is a steel that is gonna work hard in more than something like your 1080, and it did. And uh, I was able I was able to get it down nice and tight though before the epoxy, you know, without the epoxy setting. And then I let the epoxy set, and now we here we are shaping the handle. So good uh, sturdy handle construction on this thing. So I did kinda get into the forge finish on the bolster a, a touch. Um, just so, you know, probably could have avoided that a little more, but just get that uh, hand that handle wood and the copper spacer finished down, and it's still got most of the forge finish on there. It looks looks pretty good, so pretty happy with that. So I've been kind of experimenting with uh, wire brush finishes on on different surfaces on knives lately, and this is a brass wire brush. And it does a really nice job of bringing out the, the, the natural sheen or luster of a forge finish uh, steel. Um, and so I like to use it on that. And then I went ahead and just brushed on the copper um, spacer and the butt plate as well and the wood. And what that is kind of kind of pulled open the softer grains of the wood and kind of um, just gave it a, a real textured feel and look to it. Overall, a real rustic kind of look, and then you know, put your linseed oil on that, like you saw, and make that make that into a real nice handle. Um, I, I think that so there it is. That's that's the finished thing. It took a really nice keen edge, and for a whole testing regimen, uh, go check out the other video and see how it performed. It did really well, but uh, check that out. I, I really like how it turned out. Gotta be honest. I think sometimes you know I see knives that are super nice knives, but they just have a clinical look to them. And this knife, by contrast, has I feel like has a real natural, elemental, even earthy sort of feel that feels kind of frontier or just, I just like it. So anyway, there it is, guys. I appreciate you watching, as always, and we'll see you on the next video.